think we should give them a good hand. Would you like to? <laughs> while, the, while the camera lights are on these young people, I want you to look into their faces. Isn't that a beautiful sight to see all these young, handsome, good-looking young men and women? I tell you, it's a comfort nowadays when we wonder if it's juvenile delinquents that's the problem. It's good to see juveniles dedicated unto the Lord. I tell you, I, I, I was dealing with a young kid the other day that, uh, well, I don't know what he's riding. I don't know where he's flipping pills or riding the needle, but LSD backslid in him. And this boy has quite an expression. And he asked me, he said, Preacher, where do you go to get your kicks? I said, man, I got mine way back at Calvary. He said, well, when is the next bus leaving? You know, he was wanting to go. But it's good to see all you young people. They drove 500 miles in a trailway bus from Milan, Tennessee, to come and sing just for us tonight. So I know you appreciate that. Thank you, Brother Dalton. Now, we're going to have another song in just a few moments, but it's so good to see all of you. It's a packed house. It's good to see that folks still pack out a house for the Lord. Amen. And it's good to have you here. Bless your hearts. We, the balcony is filled up, and really there's no tool line bringing them in. They just came of their own volition, and it's wonderful. I tell you, we have a barker outside, and he's doing a tremendous job. And somebody walked out front and said, you know, Bob Harrington is just really doing this for publicity. And this guy out front said, well, I don't care what he's doing it for. I saw him on the Art Link Letter House Party, and if that was publicity, he said that's what got him under conviction. He came down to my office, and he gave his heart to the Lord. And he's out there now. This first time he's ever barked at any club, and he's barking for Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? That's the beautiful part about it. You know, when you open up on a place like Bourbon Street and you're a little bit forward like I try to be for the Lord, people, you know, the odds down here are nine to one that I'm Elma Gantry reincarnated. Now, isn't that pretty good? I can hardly wait to see what the payoff's going to be one day. But the wonderful thing about it is the fact that you can be happy in the Lord. I used to think to be a real Christian, you had to quit smoking, drinking, cussing, chewing, and acting ugly, and just dry up and die. I didn't know about the good things you started. I didn't know that you could have the joy that you could have in serving the Lord. Well, bless your heart. I want you to listen now as a young man by the name of Wally Fowler. I know you've heard of Wally Fowler. Amen. This is a boy of Grand Ole Opry fame. Came down here from Nashville, Tennessee. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> to be here tonight, this old boy is the one that helped originate these all-night gospel singings. And you've heard him and seen him on television on the Wally Fowler show and different other programs. He's going to sing with Ronnie Cole. You know Ronnie is here tonight from down Cold Corner right on the corner just a few doors from here but when Ronnie heard we was having this tonight I said Ronnie what are you going to be doing Tuesday night he said I'm going to be down at the show bar playing the piano for the preacher when he's having the services so Amen. Ronnie Cole let's give him a good hand would you please <laughs> thank you very much Ronnie Cole now we want you to listen as Wally Fowler sings for us just a closer walk with thee Wally Fowler I am weak, but thou art strong. Jesus, keep me from all wrong. I'll be satisfied as long as I walk, dear Lord, close to thee.
probably have him back a little bit later. I could just hear some of these holding the thou sisters saying they're patting their feet. Isn't that terrible? First time, first time a lady heard me preach in one of these downtown high steeple, few people type Sunday morning crowds. I never will forget what she said. She said, your kind of preaching went out of date with the covered wagon. I said, well, you should have been on it, you know, trying to encourage her and let us see. She said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to call some of my circle friends. It should have been squares. But she says, hey, we're going to go home and pray for you. I said, you go ahead, sister, because I need the prayer, and it sounds like you need the practice. And that way we'll all get blessed. I don't know when anybody ever got that kind of idea that when you get Christianity, it dries you up. A lot of people think when you get happy in the Lord, you're supposed to look like you're the next step to the grave. That's the reason I tell no wonder the young people of the day would rather follow the Beatles than the church members. The Beatles look like they're going somewhere, and the average church member looks like he's sorry he's been. And that's about the picture. <laughs> Amen. Uh, and the Bible says, happy is the man that knows the Lord. Now listen to me closely. Jesus said, I came that you might have what? Life. Say that word. Life. And have it how? More abundantly. Man, you don't have to flip pills or ride a needle and pop bottles to have life. Isn't it amazing? See, now there's a can on the billboards that say, where there's so-and-so, there's life. Oh, you don't know that's true. Follow a few cans home and you'll see the finished product instead of the finest product. I guess the most, I guess the most non-hypocritical alcoholic advertising on the road today is Smirnoff Vodka. You know what Smirnoff's slogan is? It'll leave you breathless. <laughs> it will. It'll flat kill you. But that's a picture of it today. You know, now these people think you've got to be on something to enjoy life. I met a fellow the other day, and he was leading his Persian cat down the street. You know, these, these are the kinds, you know, you don't know whether they missed us or misses or mistakes. And I was talking to him, and he was just fixing to burn his draft card. I said, man, save your matches. You're full F already. You know, it, it's amazing nowadays what people will do to get a little attention. But the greatest attention a person can have this side of heaven is to know who you are and where you're going. Well, right now, we're going to have an unusual treat for you. We're going to let you hear a young lady sing a gospel hymn that I'm sure you'll remember this for a long time, and I know she will. And if someone will be helping the star of this particular nightclub, uh, the act that follows this one, I appreciate Jim Perry's statement in the state's item, says, Bob Harrington's new act. Well, you know, I work for the greatest producer and director that's ever organized a play, Amen. and we've never had any flops, and every one of you one day is going to see my producer and director. And I hope you'll go on to heaven instead of the other place. People say, well, I don't believe in the other place. Well, that won't change the temperature one degree. But it's amazing how, how you meet so many people. You know, that you could say there's no cancer, but you still might have it. You know, we used to not believe in hurricanes in New Orleans, but they do now. Isn't that amazing? People do now. I tell you, Hurricane Betsy destroyed a lot around New Orleans, but it was a blessing in disguise because the people in the French Quarter found out there was another Lord besides Calvert's. It's amazing. And that wind, when that wind got to blowing about 130, 140 miles an hour, it's a bartender up the street here. He's a real dedicated Christian. He goes to Mass every time he's sober, and he has this, uh, has this tremendous crucifix that he wears around the neck. And, and you know, it kind of works with his religion a bit there. And when that wind got to blowing about 130, 140 miles an hour, this boy's real religious. He has a tattoo of the cross on his arm, and he has love on one hand and hate on another. You know, real spiritual. And this particular guy, I never will forget when the wind got to blowing a little strong, and he got it going around 130. I saw this bar dinner come running toward my office, and, and he, I noticed he had something in his hand, and it was his crucifix. And he hollered, Preacher, how you work this thing? How you work this thing? <laughs> Brother, let me tell you, when it comes to this thing of death, you'd never meet a tough man. Because when folks start dying, they start praying. Yeah. And I always tell people this, if the Lord's good enough for you when you're dying, you ought to try him when you're living. He won't hurt you one bit. Right now, the star of the show bars, show that follows ours, is a young lady by the name of Patty White. Ex-school teacher turned stripper, and we're praying that she will add to that. Ex-school teacher turned stripper, then saint. Right now, yeah. Patty White will sing as Ronnie Cole accompanies her on the piano. And Patty, why don't you come over and sing from here? I believe they can hear you a little bit better, and Ronnie can accompany you there. Patty White, the star of this particular show. Let's give her a hand. Thank you. 
you very much, Patty White. We appreciate it so much. Ronnie, if you'd be turning in the hymn book there to America, my country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty. I may be kind of old-fashioned, but I love America. I'm so proud I'm an American, I don't know what to do. You know, we've got so many antis today, folks don't know really who's on what side. And, you know, I find most of these that are antis are wanting something for nothing. Did you ever read the story in the Bible about the prodigal son? Now, what happened to the prodigal son in the Bible? He looked around and saw himself in a hog pen. And when he saw all of his pig friends, he said, now, this is not the place for me. So he got up and went back to the father. Now, let's bring his prodigal son up to the 20th century. Let's say he's living in America in these prosperous days, and he sees himself in a hog pen. Well, instead of getting up and getting out, he'll write to Washington. And the letter will get into the hands of the right ones and channeled over to the poverty program head. And I'm sure Sergeant Shriver will read this letter and then he'll see that the man is really in a hog pen and he's down in this sloppy atmosphere. So instead of the prodigal son getting up and getting out, Washington will write back, Dear prodigal son, we've read your awful case. Would you stay where you are? Don't you dare get up and get out. Because we in Washington are going to improve the hog pen we're going to come put air wick in your slop. We're going to pad the troughs. And we're going to put little black and white pigs in there to play with you. And then about the pigs are hot. And that's about to be with everybody today. Everybody today, everybody today is wanting something for nothing. Isn't that about the picture? Nowhere in the Bible did the Lord ever try to get a man out of the slums, but he died to get the slums out of the man. And we can put it back in that order then we could find something to do about it. But this is a day when people like to make the living other than by the sweat of the brow. The Bible teaches that we do with these hands which are good unto the Lord. You know, we have a man that's going to sing for us right now, and I appreciate you. You're one of the most responsive audiences that I've ever had. Because usually in a church, everybody tries to sit around the first day or two and figure one another out. You know, because they like to look around. And a fellow I met on the street the other day, he said, I wouldn't go to that church up there where you go. He said, there's nothing up there but a bunch of hypocrites. I said, well, there's one less. He said, how is that? I said, you moved your letter. But it's amazing how he said, he said, well, I just wouldn't go to that church because I know how to live. I said, we do too. Won't you come on up and help us get them right? Isn't it amazing how easy it is to stand back and point a finger? I used to point a finger at everybody in that problem, but one day it dawned on me when I was pointing out, I had three coming back at me. And then I decided to get old Bob right. When Bob got right, you'd be surprised how you can help somebody else. He even helped me fall in love with my family, my friends, and even my bill collectors. You learn to love them. You know, you welcome them now instead of running out the back door. But it's great what the Lord can do with a person. And I was speaking in a convention not long ago. I got an opportunity to hear the mayor, Victor Skiro, here in the city, named me chaplain of Bourbon Street. And I appreciate that very much. And once in a while, they asked me to speak in local conventions. And I was following the man, I think, was president of one of the big phone companies. I don't know where it's AT&T or one of the subsidiaries. And he got up talking about how AT&T never missed a year paying a dividend. Through the greatest days of the Depression, he said, AT&T came on through. We paid off. And well, after, I don't know why they had me follow this man unless they believed in life after death or something. But this man, you know, he just didn't ring the bell. And it's right after lunch. So finally, they called on me to speak. And I said, ladies and gentlemen, you've heard Mr. Bell. I wasn't sure that was his name, but I'm sure Alexander was real proud of him. I said, you've heard him talk about AT&T. I said, let me tell you about my company. I work for God the Father, Jesus the Son, the Holy Spirit and company. And everybody who's been born again, redeemed, transformed, adopted, predestined, elected, atoned for is a stockholder in the kingdom of God. And I said, our organization never misses a day, a week, a month, a year without paying a dividend. We'll pay them not only up to the grave, but we'll pay them beyond the grave in a place called heaven. This so old fellow Amen. punched a boy by me and he said, AT&T can't top that. <laughs> and they but isn't it amazing how, how people get so excited o over things like out here. The Sugar Bowl is wonderful. I love to watch it. But you get some guy running down the field, you know, with a bag of zipped up air. And folks, look at it, look at it, look at it. You know, and down here on Bourbon Street, New Year's Eve, everybody lives it up and drinks and be merry. But what's the last part of that cliche? Live, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you may what? Die. Say that word. Die. People don't like to talk about that. You ever get a card in the mail, Mary death, happy dying? People just normally don't like, people like to live forever. See, that's the philosophy of people. I was talking to a guy the other day, tried to get him right with the Lord. He said, man, I don't need him yet. See me when I'm dying. I said, well, will you tell me what time that is? He said, well, nobody knows. I said, well, let's talk about it now. He said, well, I don't believe this is the right place to be saved. I said, you don't believe you'd be saved here on the street? He said, no. I said, where do you got to go? And he pointed over the steeple of St. Louis Cathedral. I said, you mean to tell me that you think you got to go to church to be saved? He said, yeah, I do. I said, sir. He said, what? I said, you go go to the funeral home to die? He said, man, you're back on that dying again. It took off down the street. People just don't like to talk about death. You know, a lot of the gals around here, a lot of the strippers, a lot of the uh, different club owners, they were talking to me. They said, you know, you, you Christians, nothing but phonies. 
said, well, you're nothing but hypocrites. I said, you know what a hypocrite is? He said, and she said, yeah, it's, a, it's somebody acting like something or not. I said, well, you strippers are that. I said, I see you on the street, and some of you look like, you know, rejects from the Salvation Army, but at night I can see you on the pink light, blue light, and somebody else's hair, and somebody else's eyes, and somebody else's skin. And I said, you're nothing but skinny hypocrites. I want you to know there'll be no offering taken so you Baptists can relax. <laughs> There'll be no candles sold so you Catholics can put your matches back in your pocket. And I want you to understand everything here tonight is free, including salvation, which is a gift of God. Isn't that wonderful if it's a gift? I talked to a man the other day, and he said, I don't believe it's a gift. I believe you got to work for it. I said, well, how far are you in heaven? He said, I'm four floors in hell. You know, really, people, people think about this idea. I was talking to a man about a heaven and a hell. He said, I don't believe in heaven. I said, do you believe in hell? He said, man, well, I might. I said, there got to be a hell. He said, why? I said, a man like you would be out of place in heaven. And that's so true, because anybody that doesn't love the things of God, doesn't love the Bible, doesn't love the church, they'd be miserable with a bunch of saints spending an eternity in a place called heaven. I'm glad there's a heaven, because I'd hate to know that this is all that life had to offer Amen. is right here on this earth. Aren't you glad there's a heaven? Aren't you glad there's a Savior, there's a Lord? All right, let's sing together now. My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty. I would ask you to stand, but you can't possibly where you are. So let's sing it now like we are and like we see it. Are you, do you love your country? Do you love America? I'll tell you, I, when I fell in love with God, it helped me to fall in love with my country. And you know, I even enjoy praying for our president, praying for our leaders. Folks, well, I'm not going to pray for him. Well, you probably just don't know how. <laughs> like a man on the street the other night, he said, I'm a preacher too. I said, what kind are you preaching? He said, the same thing you are. I said, well, what, what do you want to talk to me about? He said, well, I don't like your methods. I said, well, what are your methods? He said, well, I don't know if I have any. I said, well, I like mine better than I do yours. You know, it's, it's amazing how you meet these characters always ready to down you, but thank God Christianity lifts you. My country, tis of thee. Wally Fowler, come lead us as we sing this. My country, tis of thee, sweet land of... It's been a long time since some of us sung it. Is that right? You know what we're going to do right after we sing this? We're going to pledge allegiance to our flag. You know, I, some, I talked to a man the other night. He said, I hadn't done that when I, since I was in grammar school. He said he dropped out after that. But let's, uh, let's have Wally lead us as we sing My Country, Tis of Thee. My country, Tis of Thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the dead. where your heart's located. Think back a little bit. It's there. It's there. Maybe this will kind of stir us up a little bit as we pledge allegiance. All right, ready together. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so very much. God bless you for that. Now, there was one part of that we're going to come back to in just a moment in our Wake Up America crusades throughout the country. We're gearing it around one nation. Say the rest of it. One nation under God. Now, is it a nut? I just wonder where God fits into your calendar of events. While in Vietnam, I asked a young boy as I stood there and talked to him and saw the fact that he was over there shedding his blood, willing to die for us. I asked myself, maybe you can answer what is it that will cause a young man, 18 years of age, maybe he's not shaving twice a week yet, to pick up arms and go 10,000 miles away to possibly die for his country, and sometimes on a Sunday morning you can't even get a Christian to pick up his Bible and walk across the street to church to live for his God. Now would you tell me what it is that makes a man die for his country but won't live for his God? What is it, ladies and gentlemen, would you tell me? Because that's the answer that we need to have. If this be a nation under God, then why don't we live like it? You know, God has blessed America. And I believe whenever we keep turning away from God like we're going, the blessings of God are going to stop in our country. I want you to listen now as a young man comes to sing for us, Earl Williams, who's also a star here in this particular club. He sings in his church choir, he told me. I want you to listen to him now, and I'm sure he'll bless your heart. And right after this, I want to come and bring the final 
remarks that I have. Don't want to keep you any longer than you have to. Because see, in church, you wouldn't have had the opportunity to smoke like you do here. So that's the only reason we dismiss early in church is so the deacons can run out and smoke. But anyway, we're here. Here in uh, the nightclub, you don't even have to run out. Just stay there and eat it. Bless your heart. <laughs> I was talking to a man the other day. He said, you preach so much on smoking. He said, and he's read so much about the harm of it, he just gave up reading. I want you to listen now as Earl Williams sing for us.
Colonel Williams, I know you enjoyed that. Right now, I would like for us to repeat together, I guess, the most famous scripture verse in the Bible. What would that be? John 3, 16. Let's say it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> that word, whosoever. How many people in here tonight are included in that whosoever? Would you raise your hand up in the air? That means a whole world. Isn't that wonderful? And I think about the world. It used to be so big, but now in just a few hours, 14 hours it took me to go to Vietnam. And I went over there to try to encourage the troops a little and preach to them some and tell them about the things of God. But instead of my encouraging those fellas, those fellas encouraged me. I found some men that know who they are and where they're going, know what they're doing. And you know, those fellows over there are kind of proud, they're Americans. And I wanted to know that there's some thinking people back here in America who are proud of those boys. Boy, it breaks my heart nowadays when I see these so-called antis, because really in America, it's always the little thinkers that become big stinkers. Don't you believe that's the truth? Amen. It's those people that wouldn't know what to do with something they want, even if it got it against their will, possibly. So I just enjoy preaching and telling folks about the Lord. Some fellow asked me the other day, he said, when are you going to quit preaching, Brother Bob? And about that time a hearse came by. I said, when folks quit dying, I'll quit preaching. But you know, the greatest joy in the world is not necessarily the heaven that we're going to, because if there were really no such thing as life after death, and I was talking to this Buddhist cab driver in, in uh, Vietnam. In fact, over in Vietnam, I tried to talk to anybody I could. Because I'm big and I'm saved and I'm going to heaven, but I was scared over there. You all know the truth about it. I was scared. I, even though I'm saved and, and prepared to go to heaven, I don't want to get in that next load, you know. And, and so I was talking to this, this cab driver. And I was talking to him about becoming a Christian. And he said, uh, me Buddhist. I said, all right, me Christian. He said, oh, I'll be one of those. I said, what do you mean by that? He said, well, if being Buddhist is good, being a Christian is good, I'll be Buddhist Christian. I, you know what he was really saying is what the average person says today. If being a communist is good, being American is good, I'd be both. Playing both ends against the middle, hoping to wind up with something on the end. But that's about the situation life is today. So I said, let's compare our religions. He said, all right, let's do that. I knew enough of his language. He knew enough of mine, so we just talked English. And so I said, tell, tell, tell me about Buddha. He said, Buddha was born for his people. I said, so was Christ. He said, Buddha lived a life to set an example for his people. I said, so did Christ. He said, Buddha died for his people. I said, so did Christ. He said, Buddha was buried for his people. I said, so was Christ. I said, come on, come on. He said, what do you mean? I said, Christ arose for his people. He said, Buddha hadn't made it yet. <laughs> you know, and that's, that's about the lots of religions, but thank God Christianity has a risen savior. I'm glad of that. I'm glad that he not only so loved the world, but he proved his love and that he gave his only begotten son, that, say it with me, that whosoever believeth, let's say that word, believeth in him, should not what? Perish, but have everlasting. Don't you deal with a lot of folks that are perishing? I used to think perishing meant going to hell or something like that. But you know, if there were no hell or no heaven for life after death, just being right with the Lord while you're alive is the greatest thing in the world. Why, he hadn't hurt me. He hadn't cramped my style. He's loosed everything of my life. He, he's made me enjoy the things that I have. He's made me enjoy my family, my children, and the things of life. But I was telling a group at a school the other day, and they'd had just enough science to make them smart, you know. And I think this one I was talking to, his name was Ellick. And he, he was so smart that he knew already everything, proved there's a God, you know. And this fellow's a giant of a size boy. His fuzz breaking through his pimples. And he was, he was really, you know, he's really tough. He probably had his own little chemistry set at home. And Mama was hoping he'd blow up or something. But anyway, he, he, was, he was there, you know. He's hid behind his tie. And he puffed up his chest and pulled it up to 26 inches. And I said, what, what do you want with me, man? He said, I want to tell you what I'm is. I said, what are you? I think he flunked English. I said, I said, what are you? He said, I'm an atheist. Well, I didn't know whether to quit preaching or quit praying or just tell, poor Lord, he's out of it. I'm an atheist. I said, I really know what you are, but I'm saved. I can't tell you. He said, well, i tell you, i tell you, I don't believe there is a God. I said, well, bless your heart. I said, they might just happen to be one. And you might just be, I'll tell you, I don't believe there's a God. 
He said, I'm an atheist. I said, well, you told me that. I said, what do you believe? He said, I believe there's not a God. I said, well, what do you believe there is that they're not that you think they won't be? He said, what? What'd you say? See, you get these little uh, uh, geniuses off the track. They got to run back and call a mama or something. I said, you believe there's no God? He said, yeah, I don't believe there's no God. I said, yes, there is. He said, no, there's not. I said, yes, there is. He said, no, there's not. I said, wait a minute, man. How can you say there's not a God unless there is a God if you say there's not one? He said, run that by again, preacher. Run that by. <laughs> you know, what was wrong? He had a schizophrenic, paranoid, inverted type of complex. He's trying to get a little attention. He wasn't old enough to burn his draft card. But it's amazing. <laughs> and there he stood, you know, his hair. You know, God says every hair on our head's numbered. But a lot of these characters are working God over time. But anyway, it's amazing how you meet so many people nowadays that don't believe there is a God, but that's all right. I talk to them when they're alive and think they're going fast. But I talk to them when they die, and they all time want to pray when they die. Some of the toughest characters on Bourbon Street when they start dying, you ought to hear them say, oh, God, have mercy. Have mercy on me. Better take just about three minutes, and we're going to let you go. It's a little warm in here. We appreciate the management of the show bar for making things so presentable for us and extending such a wonderful cooperative attitude toward us coming here. And if you notice, even covered up the booze here tonight, just in case someone hanging over the bar couldn't wait till I said amen. We appreciate it. We appreciate it. We pray. You know, a lot of the wonderful things happened to me on Bourbon Street. When I first opened up down here, I was right below Al Hurt's place, and Al Hurt has a sign out front, he's the king, you know, and the little crown on his head and the trumpet in his hand, and Al has a lot of attributes, but humility hadn't made it yet, and he's, he's just, you know, he, he's there with his crown on his head, and so I thought what I'd do in my little office down the street is put a picture of me with a Bible in my hand, and I put a little note under it right in the bottom, I'm a child of the king. Well, folks got to look it around, and they'd run back, and they'd look up there, and he's the king, and he's the child. And did you know word spread around the quarter here that Al Hurt had a boy down there preaching? <laughs> but, you know, I meet a lot of folks, and I guess most, I guess one of my closest buddies is Murphy Arsenault. Murphy is my barber over here. I want you to meet Murphy. A uh, lady, uh, not, no, it wasn't a lady. Well, he might have been. Well, I don't know, really. <laughs> It's so hard nowadays, I had to marry a couple the other day like that. And I said, well, whichever one you are, take whichever one this is to be whatever y'all gonna be. You know, it's, 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 it's hard. Uh, anyway, see, if I mention Murphy's name five times, I get free clippings, you know. And it's just wonderful seeing a man buy peanuts, made me feel at home. But you know, and Murphy here, just a while ago, I was thinking about, I was walking down the street and and one of these fellows said, I understand you use spray net on your hair. I said, well, yes, I do. He said, you must be a sissy. I said, grab me. <laughs> grab me. <laughs> well, if you should have been there. But it's amazing. <laughs> Nowadays, I was on the local TV here one night, and a lady called me afterward, and she said, oh, you know, your hair and body makes me think of Samson. I said, hang up, your voice makes me think of Delilah. You know, <laughs> You meet so many people. But you know, that's the wonderful thing about being a preacher is the fact that you can enjoy life as much as anybody else in the world and it's not near as burdensome. You know, I was talking about no heaven or hell. If all you did when you got right with the Lord was get rid of a guilty conscience, it's wonderful, isn't it? Huh? I'd hate to stand up here and try to eyeball all you folks and have a guilty conscience tonight. You know, I don't mind what others think of me, but I'd sure hate to think they was right and they were right. But it's wonderful to have a, a conscience that's not guilty anymore. I studied pre-med at the University of Alabama, and I can name every, you know, I can name every muscle in the body and every nervous system, and I can name every joint in the body and in town. And I had all this knowledge going for me, see, and I just couldn't find the conscience. I said, hey, doctor, where's the conscience? He said, it's in there somewhere, Bob. I said, oh, doctor, if we could find the conscience, and when he gets guilty, if we could cut it out, you know, and charge about 500 down, let Medicare take care of the rest, oh, we'd have a something going. He said, oh, Bob, it's in there. But isn't it awful to have a guilty conscience? That's what caused people to flip pills, ride needles. That's what caused people all these things. But anyway, be that as it may, if all you did when you got right with the Lord was get rid of a guilty conscience, I remember I used to be in the room and hear my wife on the telephone, and she'd be saying, hello? Mm-hmm. Is that right? You don't say. When did that happen? And man, I'd be climbing a wall in the other room. See, it's an awful, it's an awful thing. I could be, you know, I used to be in, in a school and hear the principal pick up the intercom system, just clear his voice, and I'd start running to the office. It's just awful to have a guilty conscience, isn't it? You know, let me ask you something. How many of you have ever had a guilty conscience? Raise your hand. Let's see around about. Oh, that's fine. Now the rest of you are gonna have one for lying. It's awful. It's awful to have a guilty conscience. But you know, here's the plan that we try to take wherever we go in our country. 
And we soon will be in Washington. We hope to meet the president and, and go back to see our Congressman Hale Boggs, who was so instrumental in helping us get over to Vietnam. And we appreciate what these fellows are doing in our country. See, if what I'm talking about tonight is the truth, and based on the Bible, I believe it to be the truth, then it behooves us as God's people to live like it's the truth, walk like it's the truth, talk like it's the truth. And when we put into practice what God's put in our heart, the other people in America will be wanting what we have. Listen to me as I close. I talked to a man just as he was dying here on the street a few nights ago. I talked to him at Charity Hospital as they're going on into eternity. But I'll never forget the night as I stood beside the bed of a little girl and saw her go off into eternity. I saw the mother and the daddy of this little four-year-old girl, Vicky, try to comfort one another as they stood by the body of this little girl. I didn't know what it was like that night, but I know what it's like now. Because at that time, I'd never lost a child. I lost a loved one close to me. My mom and daddy are still living. But just a few months ago, I saw them as they took my little son's body and put it back into the best. And I know what it's like now to face death and try to comfort folks when they die. But as I rode the elevator of Oxnard Foundation Hospital down to the lobby, a little old boy asked me when I opened the door. He said, you brother Bob? I said, yes, I am, son. He said, preacher, I'm an altar boy down here at the cathedral, and I hear him talking about heaven and hell and eternity. Would you tell me something, preacher? How far off is heaven? How far off is eternity? I said, son, the best way I can answer that is just ask you to put your hand up on your chest. And he did. I said, what do you feel, fella? He said, I, I feel a heartbeat, preacher. I said, that's it, son. How far off is heaven? How far off is hell? It's just one heartbeat. And as he felt the beat of his heart, I feel the beat of mine. Inside of every man, woman, boy, or girl listening to me is that organ called the heart. At night, at day, at work, at play, it's beating. The Bible said, he that beginneth life in you has the power to stop it. Now let me ask you a question, ladies and gentlemen, personal it may be. But where will you spend eternity? Will it be in heaven or will it be in hell? How far off is eternity? Just one heartbeat.